When I came to America, I tried to forget everything. But with the war going on right now, I'm definitely remembering more and more things. A lot of flashbacks to orphanage life. There were a lot of weird PTSD dreams. I don't know why I'm waking up screaming, wanting to kill somebody. It was really, really hard because if I didn't get adopted and if I'd never gotten found, I would have been there fighting for survival. I feel saved out of the orphanage. I feel saved out of Ukraine, saved by golf. Because the Soviet mindset is if you're a handicap, you're useless. No human is a waste. No human is unredeemable. I was born in a hospital in Ukraine and was put up for adoption right away. I was born with a bilateral cleft lip and palate, so I had a hole in my mouth that went all the way through my soft palate and into my hard palate. And born with one arm as well. So right here, I've got the top of the humerus uh, and all these ligaments that connect, and then I've got like a third of a scapula back here too. <laughs> And so I'm able to, to do a lot of cool things with it. Born in 1992, Sergei Chechenko's birth defects are the result of nuclear radiation from the 1986 Chernobyl disaster in northern Ukraine, likely due to contaminated river water that flowed through the region. Just days after his birth, he was given up by his parents and sent to a nearby orphanage in central Ukraine. Orphanage life, yeah, it's hard. It sucks. Punishments would either be like isolation or they'd put soap in your eyes, which is horrible. If we were loud and run bunches right before bed, they would put us to sleep with vodka. So to this day, I can't drink vodka. I can't smell it, I, I hate it. We would eat one to two meals a day. If we got lucky, we would have bread and then borscht cabbage stew. And man, it was, uh, it wasn't the best. I actually don't think I would have survived the orphanage with the lack of food and nutrition. I really don't. We started trying to have kids, and for whatever reason, they never could figure out why we were unable to have our own biological children. And eventually, I just said to Anton, I'm kind of done with this. Elizabeth and Anton Forey, both born in South Africa, met while Elizabeth was visiting a church where Anton was pastoring. After getting married, they relocated to Birmingham, Alabama, where Elizabeth had attended college, and began trying to start a family. But in 1998, after more than two years of trying, they decided to accept a life without children. I had briefly mentioned adoption. Anton was not very open to it at all. I think I actually said, God will have to change my heart and my mind. And that was on a Saturday evening. And then on Sunday, we met Vic. I first met Sergei in the House of Babies, an orphanage in Ukraine. He was probably the worst of the children there. I said, OK, we'll have to do something about this. Vic Jacobson, a British pastor and missionary who dedicated his life to prison ministry and orphanages in Ukraine, arranged to have Sergei travel to the UK for facial surgery to repair his lip and palate. Just a week before the surgery, Vic was scheduled to be a guest preacher at Anton Forey's church in Alabama and spoke to the congregation about Sergei's story. He said, this child needs to be adopted to a couple who is childless because he's going to need a lot. And I started weeping, which is not something I do. And I just had this overwhelming sense that he was going to be my son. 
It was such a lightning moment in my life. I didn't have an option. This is what I had to do. But this had to happen and it had to happen soon. After the age of seven, Sergei would be labeled unredeemable by the state and placed in a psychiatric ward with adults. Unredeemable was the term they had for him. They'd rather invest in the ones that were not hopeless. Just months from his seventh birthday, and in England recovering from surgery, the Foreys sprang into action to adopt him. We actually met him the very next weekend, which was Mother's Day. It was as if it happened yesterday. He greeted us as Mama and Papa, and of course, you know, we're like, oh. He was absolutely tiny. He was about 30 pounds, but just this incredible resilience and spirit. There was a, an immediate bond that had taken place there. And I knew that this was the beginning of a beautiful journey. When I left the orphanage, it just kind of clicked, like, okay, these are my parents. You know, ride or die. <laughs> we didn't know what in the world we were getting into. He had never been in a bath, never had a hot shower, never had eaten solid food. See every captive free to shake thy dice. He'd never slept alone a night in his life. He was terrified. He couldn't speak English, and the world is made for people with two arms. Everything was difficult. But we were very, very committed to not raising a victim. We decided that we wanted to teach him independence. My dad's like, here's a fishing rod, figure it out. I said, I'm gonna take him to play golf, put a couple of balls on, I said, you figure it out. He put the ball down and he figured out that with his left hand he could get more rotation, he could hit the ball a little bit further and so he started playing. I was within days of him coming to the States. They stuck to their guns and didn't allow me to have any excuses, and I'm grateful for that. Good shot. Stripes, right? This independence and self-assuredness would come in handy as Sergei, whose name was changed to Alex to make his transition to the States easier, entered his teenage years. In my mind, I wanted to be normal like everybody else. I think that's why I got so good at sports. Soccer, tennis, golf, fishing, hunting, football. People call it overcoming. I call it trying to live a normal life. In high school, I was probably a mid-80s, high-80s golfer, which for people, it was like, oh, you have one arm, that's good. Well, for me, that was trash. It was after high school that I really picked it up. In college, Alex began shooting in the 70s. After graduating, he began working toward passing the PGA's player ability test, a requirement for PGA membership. Don't let that go up. There you go. In 2020, he passed that 36-hole test, becoming the first person in the country with one arm to do so, allowing him to become an assistant pro at his local course. But even though adaptive golf, which allows people with physical challenges to compete, was growing in popularity, Alex was hesitant to get involved. Now I'm like, no, I'm a regular human, normal human. I'm gonna beat two-armed people. But when I realized it wasn't about being normal, it was about growing the game. And instead of proving people wrong, hey, let's inspire. Beautiful. That was straight. I like it. It's really good. Alex began entering adaptive tournaments in 2020, eventually becoming the country's top-ranked one-arm golfer. But the highlight in his golf journey came in July of 2022, was invited to compete in the USGA's inaugural U.S. Adaptive Open at Pinehurst. From Knoxville, Tennessee, Alex Forey. It was a culmination of a lot of hard work that people didn't see behind the scenes. And a lot of emotional battles and a lot of sacrifices. 
the years of being bullied, the years of trying to prove people wrong, realizing you didn't actually have to prove anybody wrong. You're just who you are. We go from a Ukrainian orphanage, from Borscht and Cope in our eyes, to being at Pinehurst, playing the American birthplace of golf. Like, it's amazing. Golf takes you places where no man would ever take you. Golf takes you places where no man would ever also take you places no man can. On February 24th, 2022, Russian forces invaded Ukraine in a major escalation of an eight-year war that has since become the bloodiest conflict in Europe since World War II. It was really, really hard. And I took it really personally. And the human side of it is missiles hitting playgrounds and orphanages. What level of evil do you have to have to be able to do that? The Russian military is indiscriminate. They're not just targeting military targets. Oman, a city in central Ukraine, and the location of the orphanage where Alex lived from ages two to seven, was hit hard by Russian forces in the early months of the war. All three orphanages in the city were damaged, stranding their occupants. How much more does a kid have to go through? They don't have family. They're probably fighting for food and now they have to worry about getting blown up. I took it really hard. There were a lot of flashbacks to orphanage life. There were a lot of weird dreams. He's woken himself up having a nightmare and screaming in Russian. It's just devastating how this cut Alex's heart. That's his people, it's his blood. And his initial response was, do I pick up an AK and sign up? I wanted to literally take an AR and just sit at the door of an orphanage and highly discourage anybody from going through those doors. Luckily, I've got some friends that taught me how that and helped me rationally analyze and see, hey, this is what we can do. Alex started a charity he named Single Hand Golf and began selling t-shirts in exchange for donations. Ukrainian golf pro offering to help. Alex Ford, local pro golfer, is stepping up. The goal is to move the orphans to safety on the Romania border. The initiative took off, and along with the faith-based organization Hope Now, they began relocating orphans out of Ukraine. As the war continued, Alex planned a trip to the Ukrainian-Romanian border to see his charity's effect firsthand and to make a direct impact on the ground. Something. Something inside you. But those close to him, worried about the impact returning to his homeland might have. Part of what we do, I think, as people to cope, to live, is as we suppress. And so I'm concerned about how going over to Ukraine is going to impact him emotionally. The best way I can describe it is it felt good to be home. It's like, holy shit, I'm in Ukraine. Upon arriving, Alex traveled to Sirat, a city in northeast Romania that borders Ukraine. It's a town that has become an important crossing point for both refugees fleeing Ukraine and for displaced orphans seeking safe haven from the war. You ready to go, boy? It's hard to see the refugees coming across. Some of them are walking, others are driving in cars and buses and just being scared. Scared for their life and their children's lives. Look at these people, that's all they have, that luggage right there. It's heartbreaking. But hopefully they're running to a future and a hope that they can be safe. 
The next day we went to the refugee center. Currently they have 70 people housed. They have about 20 children. It was really crowded. At some point we had 200 people in here. People give away all the stuff that's here, either clothes or food. Mm -hmm. But in order for them to feel human, we have a virtual currency and they can use the, the money and spend it here yeah. instead of feeling like beggars or something. Have a little bit of freedom. Right? Yeah, a little bit of freedom. Seeing the mural on the kids room in the refugee center, it's like, oh my God. This is very close to what the room looked like in my orphanage in Ukraine. Memories definitely came flooding back. I think that's what has made me have that special connection and bond with these refugees and these orphans. You're from Kyiv, and then how did you get here? When Boris Billy was um, crushed uh, by bombs, all the roads was full of, of cars. All uh, who were scared uh, went to another cities or countries. You could see the pain in his eyes. I can't imagine what these kids have seen, felt, and had to go through. You'll get through this and go back, but um, we're praying for you. And there's a lot of people in America that really care about you. The people that have been there a long time, it, it's definitely hard because they don't have anything to go home to. They may not be able to ever go back. And all I wanted to do was just give them a hug and tell them it was gonna be okay. It's definitely hard to see people struggling. You know, you have good emotions and bad emotions, but you can feel the hope And we were fortunate enough to get 300 orphans out of Ukraine. As Alex prepared to return to Alabama, he reflected on the decision he made to not locate his birth parents while he was in Ukraine. It was a choice that didn't stop him from imagining how the meeting might have gone. Alex said, look what you missed out on. In no way, shape, or form in my child prove them wrong, but it's like, if you would have stuck with me a little bit longer, this is who I am, and I think I'm a pretty cool person. But I have no regrets coming. It's a lot to process. I'm tired emotionally, but I definitely got some closure. I think going over to Ukraine hurt him deeply. I think he will regress emotionally. It will probably result in years of additional pain. But so often in life, it's, it's through pain that change and healing and growth comes. Alex's story just gives me hope. It gives me hope in humanity. Life is full of hard, hard hardships. But the human spirit is, is remarkable. It's mind-boggling the path that he has walked. He's probably the most mentally tough person I've ever met and is striving to make a difference in the world. And I think his future really lies in golf. I want to qualify for the PGA Championship. Breaking that barrier, I think, would be huge for adaptive golf. But my story is not about me or trying to be on the PGA Tour. I want to inspire other kids with disabilities to not only be good golfers, but to impact the world. I feel saved out of the orphanage. I feel saved out of Ukraine. And so if you're able to adopt and you have that in your heart, adopt. Because it'll change somebody's world. You never know what a seven-year-old from Ukraine will grow up and do.